is in order to understand your child, if you have a black child, Asian child or whatever, you need to understand the things that they're going to face as being who they are, because at the end of the day, racism exists and you need to learn how to deal with that. If your child comes to you and it's like, oh, somebody called me the N word today at school. <laughs> like my, how my brother, my little brother who was black, who's black experienced in, you know, in, in school. Like you need to learn how to, you need to know how, oh, okay, how do I deal with that when my, my child comes to me and tells me st stuff like that. Hello everybody, welcome back. To Hi. our channel, this is part two of six signs that you're a toxic adoptive parent. Mm -hmm. Let me know. Mm -hmm. And again, these things might hurt a little bit if you are an adoptive parent. Like again, please don't take these to heart. This is for the betterment of you and your child. And if you feel like you're this, I we highly encourage for you to step back and be like, okay, I need to change, not just for me, but also for your, you know, my child. Um, so the first one on this list is saying that you don't see color. Ooh, why do we have to start so strong? Dang. It's too strong, that's too hard. It's too, it's too much, too much for them. Uh, I'm gonna let you take that one for my time. Um, yeah, I think, and again, like I've said this before, a lot of white people say they don't see color and it's not coming from a bad place. They're trying to make it see, seem in a way of, I accept everyone. Like, I don't see color. I just see people as they are. If you're a good person, you're a bad person. And that's just how I move through life, which isn't bad. But however, if you are an adaptive parent, and even if you're not, you need to be able to actually see color because in order to understand your child, if you have a black child, Asian child or whatever, you need to understand the things that they're gonna face as being who they are, because at the end of the day, racism exists and you need to learn how to deal with that. If your child comes to you and it's like, oh, somebody called me the N word today at school. <laughs> like my, how my brother, my little brother who was black, who's black experienced in, you know, in, in school. Like you need to learn how to, you need to know how, oh, okay, how do I deal with that when my, my child comes to me and tells me st stuff like that? Cause that's, I don't know. <laughs> that's just like, you need to know. Cause that's freaking yeah, traumatic totally for the child. Like it's almost like we need to rephrase it from instead of like, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. We need to find a different phrase for that. I understand yeah. the idea and the essence, but <laughs> it's just not landing in the way that y'all want it to land. It's you not. know, like, um, I see my child, I see my child that I'm raising up, you know, mm -hmm. as a visual, you know, or something like that. I don't know. Like, but I don't see color, like, why? <laughs> yeah, and if racism did not exist, it's okay to say that, but racism would exist. And if you say that, you're erasing that person and the identity of who they are. Again, even if you don't mean adopt, you just need to understand the plight of different races and what they go through. And uh, and that goes across the board as well. You as a black person, you know, can't see, you don't see color either. And also try to understand the things that a white person may go through in, in, in this world, whether it's racism or not. And, and same thing with, I don't see a uh, race. We're all human race. No. Yeah. No, that's how I think about that. <laughs> like, yeah. That's too. Again, if like, race does no. not exist, then that's completely fine, but it, it exists. Yeah. You need to be able to see your child as black, Asian, or whatever, so you can understand them better. Mm -hmm. Um, the second, uh, do you want to add anything else to, no, to that one? Much okay. The second, the second thing on this list is adopting to fill a void inside of you. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a deep one. Um, we actually had one of our guests, Carlos. He came and kind of spoke about that because mm -hmm. his um, adoptive mom. One of the main reasons that they wanted to adopt because she was infertile. She wasn't able, or she thought at the point, mm -hmm. the doctors thought that she wasn't able to conceive. Mm -hmm. um, child and so she was trying to fill this void of mm -hmm. having a child of her own that she could take care of and yearn for and mm -hmm. all of this and um so they there was a lot of abuse and trauma with their rela their relationship was very toxic and she eventually did end up being able to have her own child mm -hmm. and after that happened after she had her own biological child she almost like mm -hmm. kind of threw him to the curb like okay well no, no, she did I, well, she <laughs> did physically yeah they did yeah. you know Technically, they did physically mm -hmm. um, throw, um, throw him to the curb and um, they kind of just let him um, go. And she was like, you know, I have my own child now and I need to focus on my child and my, you know, and you need to just do your own thing. And 
Mm-hmm. That's what happens when you try to fill a void and you get so desperate, you know, and mm-hmm. a child is not a, a, something that you should play with. An accessory. Uh, it's not an, ex- they're not, we're not accessories. Um, mm-hmm. And doesn't matter how much poverty we're coming from. You should mm-hmm. not utilize children as ways mm-hmm. to fill your void. And I was actually talking to my therapist about this, which is mm-hmm. a lot of times people who are um, really anxious and desperate for um, and relying on other people to fill that hole that they have inside of themselves that they haven't worked through. They mm-hmm. get themselves and the other person that they have put so much responsibility on to mm-hmm. fill that hole. And the, the example I use is parents use their child. It's like, you're my everything. Mm-hmm. I yeah. live. I'm just, I love you so much. I give you everything. And I warrant it, warrant it I do understand. Mm-hmm. However, when that child leaves and goes off to college, starts their own life, mm-hmm. the parent feels like, who am They're I? Leaving. Yeah. Who am I? Like, they don't have a sense of self at that point because they mm-hmm. tried to put everything into another person, that's an external factor. And I don't think that's ever healthy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and a lot of times the dynamic with, adoptive parents and children because that child usually is not ever able to fill that void because you never mm-hmm. have that biological maternal connection with the adoptive child. Yeah. You build a lot of resentment yeah. and it will put you down a path where you might do a lot of crazy things and therapeutic things and out of this world things to make that force that connection that was naturally never there or mm-hmm. meant to be in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you said it so well, girl, you put it together so well. And, and, and what Carlos was saying was that when it comes to this stuff, again, like children are not accessories and you have to go to therapy. Like if you feel like you can't have your own child, go to therapy and figure out, well, what else can I do? Like, you know, I can go through my life, not having a child, go through that and be like, that's a possibility. But yes, if you do want to adopt you have to heal that void. You have to figure out why do you feel like you need to have a child in your life? And don't just automatically, well, I want to adopt. I want to have that feeling of a child because at the end of the day, they're their own person. They're their yeah. own human beings. Like when they grow up and they're in your household, they're not an accessory to you. They're not going to do all that. They're not going to do the things that you expect them to expect them to, expect them to do to fill that void. They're going to mess up. Yeah. They're and, gonna up. and that can, like you said, like that can create resentment. And I think a lot of my, my parents, I don't think they had that, you know, of, you know, feeling a void in having their own children because they would have their, their own children, but that can create resentment where they, they, there was resentment of, of, um, some type of like buyer's remorse, buyer's remorse. And like, Oh, I, I regret adopting your child. And I'm not saying that's how my parents feel. Cause I don't, I don't, They've never said that to me, but it can it can kind of materialize in different ways where you're going to mistreat your child, even if you whether it was intentional or not. Yeah. And I think that um, I think that. um, Shoot, I was going to say something I completely forgot. I hate when that happens. But yeah, I just think that, like, it's just not something that you can force. And and, oh, this is what I was going to say. We're not saying that you should not adopt if you're mm-hmm. not infertile and you're not able to have your own children. Mm-hmm. That's not what we're saying because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it is a maternal feeling to want to have children. Mm-hmm. But some people get very desperate and it's from a very unhealthy space where they feel mm-hmm. like if they have a child, they'll have something that's going to love them or mm-hmm. they'll have some, someone that they can finally show true love to Ooh. no to learn how to show that true love to yourself first you need yeah. to, learn how to give that love to yourself first and then you can learn how to give that to your child and whatnot because yeah i've been worked on that like Fatmata was saying with the therapist or whatever and you have this child now you have two people you have to learn how to show love to that's mm. girl it's you are dropping gems on it too it's much work. <laughs> it is very 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 deep and this can also apply to just parents who do can have children where they think their child is going to be this everything and it's like you and and it's also it's dehumanizing in a way when you look at it from that perspective because you're not seeing them as their own person they're just this 
thing that you have for yourself that's going to fulfill all these needs and things for you that and when they don't you just you some of them some parents act crazy some of them some parents have such a hard time when their kids like you said grow up go to college they freak out and they have their own child their own life and it's deep it gets so deep so just go to therapy and figure out why you feel you need to have a child heal yourself first heal and then if you feel like adopting adopt yeah um and the third thing on this list is adopting to look good for charity girl you can because you have personal experience with that what i'm gonna let you <laughs> adopting for, for charity like my, like how I was in the last video, my parent, my mom, you know, went on Facebook. She admitted that she had white saviorism. And with my story, I, I was, I, um, my family, I had come from like a Christian background and I went to a Christian school where everything is about charity, saving people, saving the children. So my parents fell into that hard and it was just about them and looking good and oh look at you look at you the great white people that you are parents you are adopting you are just this awe amazing inspiring person and they led with that they led with that and they 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 forgot to do other research and things of what it's going to be like actually having that child in their house and so when it came time to get us home we came home and everything is not what it seemed <laughs> there was issues there was issues and there was traumatic things that happened to me. And again, my parents are not evil people. I want to make, I want to put that out. They're not evil people right and they didn't do things intentionally, but because they were not educated on certain things, there were things that they did that was very freaking traumatic. And to this day, they are not able to actually take accountability for that stuff. And again, it's like, if I talk about the bad stuff, they get all upset about the bad stuff. So it's like, yes, they have admitted that they had the white saviorism complex, but they haven't taken the time to like actually apologize and to see me like they still don't see me as a person it's like this and a lot of i think my parents kind of do have some um um buyer's remorse a little bit because they adopted me to fit into this you know hole that they wanted me to fit and i didn't fit in that and i'm because i'm my own person it's not like i tried not to fit yeah. I'm my own person with my own thoughts, my own ideas. And I, the more I, got, I I grew up and I got older and I was getting away from that box more and more, it became like, oh, she's just a freaking terrible child <laughs> and stuff like that. So if you have that mentality of just, you know, I look, you know, I look so good and blah, blah, blah. And it makes you feel so good that you're adopting a child in the way of how people look at you. Please, for the love of God, again, we're not saying don't, don't adopt. Step back, go to therapy. <laughs> And, and and do and think about it and be like okay wait I I have to think about the child too because they're their own person at the end of the day and do the research that is that is needed to have a child in your home that all the things that they're gonna face just do the research don't just go off of all the emotions that you feel about looking good about feeling good and do the actual real stuff that's gonna come with having a child in your home that doesn't look like you and also I think we kind of for that specific um, point. Mm -hmm to go back to the root reason why people adopt for almost like, it's beyond mm -hmm. charity, but it's like to look good, as a, to feed their ego. And, yeah, you know, I've gone to church and I see all these, like um, the propaganda that they have over, oh, we're, we're having charity to mm -hmm. random in Africa and Nigeria or Gambia or whatever. And yeah. I, you know, honestly, like I can see how easy it is to get wrapped up into that. Honestly, absolutely. Do all this message about how desperate and hungry these kids are, and so I can see mm -hmm. how it can be easy for you to say, "Hey, I want to do good, mm -hmm. uh, and and I want to take this child in, and um, I have the resources, and I and I want to be someone that saves." You know, I think mm -hmm. even about much the story, like they came out and they said the reason they wanted to adopt because they wanted to mm -hmm. save child or something they wanted to be a savior and, and save mm -hmm. kids or whatever and I it's so easy to understand why you want to yeah want to do that um but we're mm -hmm. just saying we've seen it over and over again from adoption stories mm -hmm. that's where if you're in church and you're hearing this these speeches and it sounds good you're going to missionaries mm -hmm. uh, just know in the long run there has to be something a little bit more substantial than just because the church yeah. 
telling you and you know you're going to do good for the child and yeah. the world um because what happens is after the curtains close after mm -hmm. you get all the applause from mm -hmm. and the attention from the people in the church and your community mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the real stuff that is dirty and toxic starts to come out and you just have to prepare yourself for that yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I just, I, I'm not laughing. I, sometimes with my trauma, I laugh in a way to kind of ease the pain in the way. <laughs> just don't want to get it too deep. Into it. I'm not laughing because I think it's funny. It's, um, I just remember one moment. If I'm like, let me put this wine down. Because, <laughs> this, is, uh, no, like, this is like <laughs> part of the reason, I'm going to tell you something that happened. Part of the reason why you just cannot just be on your high horse of looking good in charities because when I came to the States, because everybody like in my community knew that my parents were adopting, look at all the, you know, this family, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I came to the States and my my parents thought it was a freaking good idea to put bring me to this coffee shop where there's like Tell a church. Like at least a hundred people, at least. It was like a lot of people in this little coffee shop to meet me. And it's like a whole okay. bunch of people oh my hugging God. on me, trying to hold me, like that's freaking traumatic. I didn't know it was that big. That's kind of. It was a lot of people, girl. It was a lot of people. It was a lot of people. And I'm like, and this is like fresh on, like, in, in oh the States. Oh, my God. First time. And I'm like, that's a lot of trauma. All these people, like, I have, I, I'm like, I don't know who these people are. Why are they touching me? Why are they grabbing on me? They're parading and I think I, around. Yeah. And I think I low key that, that little part of me, I have anxiety being around a group of a lot of people like that. Cause I, I get a little, okay, I need to step out a little bit. I think that where it might, that's where it might come from. But I'm having my parents did admit they're like, that was not a fucking good idea. <laughs> and one thing I can give my parents, admitted, yeah, that's yeah good. one thing I can give my parents grace on, there was a lot of things they saw that they did and say that they were like, oh, well, I just, that was not a good idea. So there was, there was things that they did. You know, I know in the, in the last video, I was like, well, they didn't really, you know, admit to certain things. They didn't admit to certain things, but certain things they did admit that was not a good thing. So when you have that you're you're gonna fuck up your child and not a good idea if you have your if you're bringing your child home take them home to you and your family start there first <laughs> before you start introducing them to like everybody <laughs> start out slow <laughs> start out slow that's crazy i didn't even know it was that many people <laughs> Girl, it was a lot of people i was so freaking scared i was scared i was clinging on to i think i was clinging on to my mom because she was the one that I knew, my mom, my mom and my dad, and I think my sister, because I've, I talked to her so many, I talked to her a couple of times and I knew who she was. So I was clinging on to dear life. I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Oh my God. That's why. But I laugh, I laugh now because I've healed from it. I've healed from it. But Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we, yeah, we, we did good reviewing that. Yeah. The next one, number four, is not doing the proper research. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this actually, it's research in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. like research before you even adopt, mm -hmm. <laughs> pre-adoption. I think that a lot of times it's easy, you know, cause you're busy as a parent, mm -hmm. um, dealing with day-to-day -day life, your, your day-to-day -day life and working and, um, maybe mm -hmm. you're your own biological children now to go and do extra research mm -hmm. uh, that's beyond what's offered maybe on the pamphlets from foster care or adoption agencies mm -hmm. you know because you go to a certain series of classes and courses and books that mm -hmm. you have to do. but sometimes you have to do research beyond that and sometimes research is beyond just reading um and looking at videos it's like groundwork research mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people who are adopting don't do that type of research to so talk to people who are have adopted, talk to people within that culture that they're adopting. You know what I mean? That's part of research. You know what I mean? Going to yeah. the environments of, you know, mm -hmm. for example, if you're adopting a black child, environments where it's predominantly black, that's research. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. groundwork research. Um, so I think that's important. Um, and then also even um, research of like well-being of what's going to be better for your, you and your children. So like when mm -hmm. it comes to therapy, a lot of people don't really take their kids to therapy after, yeah. you know, that's part of your research. It's like, mm -hmm. what, what can we do to make sure that our kids are going to be good 
like mentally for us to be good as a family, you know, and that's part of your research, you know? Yeah. And I think the biggest research, yes, you can read books on trauma and all these different things. Like you said, the adoption agencies, they hand out pamphlets and stuff like that. The biggest part of research is involving yourself in that kid's culture. I think that is the biggest thing. Making friends with, you know, having friends that, you know, look like your child. So you can have friends at the home so they can come in and they bring their kids that look like your child. Like, that is so important. Like, it does, it, I can't even, I can't describe how amazing and how that is needed more than anything. Because you're at the end of the day, your child is living in a home where they stick out. So the more familiarity that they have around them, the better, the better and the more, the more they're going to feel grounded, the more they're going to feel more open to attaching to you, connecting to you because they feel like you can, they can trust you because you are meeting their needs. You are loving on them the way that is needed the most and they're going to be happier. Yeah. Just, you know what's so funny about the culture thing? Something mm -hmm. like, like, I've never really thought of it in this way, but mm -hmm. um, I was raised up in a more diverse community than Fatmata. Mm -hmm. um, area shout out to oakland and <laughs> there's a lot of black people there's hispanic people there's asian yeah. there's everybody in oakland yeah. and um but we lived in a very like cute like you know mm. white neighborhood it's like a little bit um wealthier white community and um but i was still surrounded mm -hmm. by a lot of diversity and um one thing i've thought about is the fact that once I did start to emerge myself more in black um, culture and black community and hanging out, having black friends mm -hmm. and um, black mentors and, um, and whatnot, I realized I never felt comfortable joining those two worlds together. Yeah. I don't know if you oh. ever felt like that. I did. Yeah. I never, like, I would feel so uncomfortable bringing my mm -hmm. parents to my black yeah. side. Yeah. You know and bringing my black friends to my white side. Yes. And I know this is not really like on research, but it's more about a little bit about culture, but it, yeah. that's why it's so important to so get research. your child mm -hmm. when they're young to get comfortable with you going into their culture mm -hmm. and first inviting black friends over to the house, that kind of stuff. Because I felt so uncomfortable inviting my black friends over. I felt so uncomfortable like having, I could never invite my white parents and white mm -hmm. siblings to like, my black events and activities and go, and things I go to. Like, it just, yeah. I don't know. It feels so uncomfortable because I was never comfortable. Like I never got used to it when I was younger. So I don't even know how to do it. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, I completely feel you. And I think part of it is, you know, one thing that I can say is like black people, not all, a lot of black people do judge black children who are adopted by white parents. So that, yeah, that true. adds to it. Um, yeah. because they're like, oh, they think you're, they look at you differently. <laughs> you look, they look like you're like, and like, but yeah, yeah. but, yeah. To, to, but to add to that, I think the other, like the major part that you were talking about is again, the research, like if you don't bring that kid's culture in your house where they're comfortable enough to like interact with them. So mm -hmm. they feel comfortable to bring them to you, you're, you're the yeah. family and you go out like seeing the interaction makes it more comfortable because they know how to act around black people or whatever race of your child like asian mexican whatever race of your child is so if you if you start that when their child is young they're gonna feel okay they're gonna feel comfortable um yeah, in, if in doing that. adoptive parent and you're white and you have a black child or hispanic whatever outside of your race mm -hmm. if your child feels comfortable enough you should test mm -hmm. this out they feel comfortable enough to invite you to activities and events that are more based around their cultural mm -hmm. activities and events, you should take that as a um, a badge of honor that mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing and your child feels mm -hmm. very comfortable around you. Because yeah. I never did. Even, yeah. when be walking, <laughs> even when I'd be walking down the street and I was with my white family and I saw a black group of people, yeah. I was like, my butt would start squeezing together. I feel so, and I'd be like all robotic. And I would just like, I wouldn't know how to act. I, I don't know. Like yeah, and I think <laughs> I did not know how to act. <laughs> I totally understand. I totally feel you. And yeah. I think also for me, it's just like when you're going around some white people, racism that they have, it kind of seeps into you a little bit too. 
and yeah. where there was times where I was genuinely like just scared of like black people. I had the stereotypical oh, yeah. mentality because of you know how I where I grew up. And yeah. then when I got out and I was around black people, of course, there's you know dangerous black people. There's you know good black people. Just like any race, it doesn't matter what race. Yeah. So yeah, so I being around other black people, I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. I love black people. What is this? What was I thinking? I love black people. Like and so this day, you would never ever get me to ever hate black people ever. I, there yeah. is so much beauty in black. There's Africans, there's black Americans, black, black Islanders, but just so like diverse in who we are. And it's, it's so, yeah. such beauty. And I kind of like, I'm like, I cannot believe like, you know, I wish I would have learned all that. Again, going back to culture, okay. I wish I would have learned all that when I was younger, yeah. you know, and actually accept my blackness in every form that comes. But yeah, yeah I totally get it. I totally get it. Yeah, I wish me and my black parents had gone to like the cookouts because sometimes oh. what happened with me and my parents is mm -hmm. that they would, um, um, they would like, because we live in a diverse area, they would drop me off at these events and activities. They would just drop me off. Yeah. And I think maybe part of it is they wanted me to feel like I had a space outside of mm. just to yeah. kind of see who I am. So it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a double edged sword, you know, where yeah. it's there's no right and wrong necessarily, but looking back at it, I think it would have been nice if maybe it yeah. started off in the house. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I would feel comfortable going out and feeling like, oh, this is not different. I have a little bit of Come a different with me. story, but it's not something to be embarrassed about or ashamed about or feel yeah. guilty. So yeah, to feel good to bring your parents along and knowing that they're gonna again, like they're gonna know what to do, they're gonna know how to be. Yeah. And to be again, like get a get a give them a taste of their own medicine of you being around them your whole life. They gotta be around you. <laughs> People look like you. I will say, I there was some embarrassment because I was like, I don't want to be that one child in the black event where I'm like the adopted girl. Adopted yeah. Girl. So that, there was that part. There's two yeah. sides. You know, there is there is sides, some un uncomfortability. That, like you know, always go to bat for your children at the end of the day as as best as you can because when they grow up they'll see that you tried that's yeah. kind of yeah yeah as long as you're trying and you are doing your best that's it yeah. Yeah. um the next thing number five is being blinded by the emotions of how great it's going to be once you adopted this child we talked about this a little bit already but we can add more to it go ahead um, so being blinded by emotions and how, again, like a lot of people, when they adopt, it's very emotional. It's an, it's an emotional thing, which is understandable. It's emotional and you feel happy and all that stuff. But yes, have the emotions of being happy, but also step back and look at the realness of what it's going to be like. Again, you can do all the research in the world until that child comes into that home. That's when it gets real, real, real. And don't have expectations of what you think your child is going to bring to you. Like whether it's an, an emotional thing or like they're going to be this great athlete or whatever smart or whatever, whatever thing that you have set up, whatever box you have set, set up for them to fit, throw that box out. Have no expectations at all. <laughs> no expectations and just allow them to be who they are, to just open up and to be who they are and not just... Oh, I'm gonna look so great. This is gonna be such a good thing. We're gonna do this. We're gonna be like that. And you know what I mean? I get I get why it can be exciting, but just take a step back and look at the realness of adoption for sure. Mm -hmm. I feel like at this point we're scaring y'all from adoption. Yeah, I know. <laughs> again, again, like, you know, disclaimer, we're not against adoption. We're not, no. at all. But this is like real talk. Like this is stuff that it's you real. have to think about it because it's just gonna throw like all this stuff is just going to vomit itself out anyways, if you don't mm -hmm. like, have awareness. So we're not, we're pro adoption. We're just also yeah. pro, like educating yourself, becoming aware, seeing sides that you're like um, mm -hmm. blinded to that you don't have awareness about. So, yeah. Yeah. I hope again, like, yeah, it's a little scary, but yeah. at the end of the day, adoption is a beautiful thing. It can be a very beautiful thing because yeah. we do admit that giving a child a better life, that is beautiful. We, yeah. we, we root for adoption. We root for good adoptions and people who are good hearted. They just want to, you know, adopt. We do, we, we root for that. Yeah. Um, so the last thing on this list, number six, adopting where you don't have friends of the race of the child. Ooh. That's a big one. That's a big one. Find you, you know that that whole talk where it's like, I'm not racist. I have at least one black friend. 
if you if that's all you can do do that you know what i mean if that's all you can do just do that because <laughs> having at least one person in the or the family that's outside of your race especially if you're white um and you're especially if you're adopting internationally from a different culture is so important um but i know for myself like my family is like super like it's all for the most part white people like jewish too and mm -hmm. But I know like we have a side, like my aunt is like Asian. And I always liked having, knowing the fact that I have at least one other person that's of a different culture, you know, and me and her bonded in that way. So it really does make an impact. Me and my auntie don't talk every single day, but just seeing her yeah. at Thanksgiving and like other, you know, family gatherings made me feel a bit more comfortable. So yeah. that just goes to show that if you have at least one other person in your friend group that, um, you know, on a consistent basis engages with your child, that mm -hmm. is your culture, I think that makes such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It helps with, first of all, just having someone who's a mentor, you mm -hmm. know, what it feels like to be part of that culture growing up, having someone that's outside of your circle, right? Mm -hmm. Having someone that maybe they can feel more comfortable talking about things that maybe they would never want to talk to you about because you mm -hmm. just understand, mm -hmm. right? Very, very important. And also try to find a friend who not only are they just there and show presence, but they are willing to like maybe take your your child out on a date or something, like do something yeah. fun, like just hang out, you know, and yeah. just like because a lot of like learning how to be a certain culture, a lot of it is nonverbal. It's not like, oh, I have to say yeah. tell you this is what it means to be black. No, we go outside, you you'll experience it, you know what I mean? Like just in the yeah in the way that you engage with other black people and other white people, Hispanic, how you eat food, um, the type of conversations you have, it's so different. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so have at least one person. And if you don't have that as an immediate friend in your circle, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different um, platforms that you can mm -hmm. utilize to yeah. befriend people that are not of your race. Yeah. And again, it's not just like an acquaintance. We're talking a friend, like a friend that you will call up and have normal conversations with, you know, and not just, oh, I'm just going to have a friend to <laughs> come over when I got, you know, questions about being black. <laughs> no, like a friend, mm -hmm. friend, you know what I mean? Because it, it has to be genuine. Your child has to see that it's genuine and that you are not just like using them to like help you in your relationship with your child. And just again, yeah. just get, just be in tune with that, with your child's culture and go out to different events. Take yourself out of your comfort zone. That is the biggest thing out of all of this. That Take is. yourself out of your comfort Isn't zone. Isn't that not what we said in the first one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take so yourself. It, that is honestly the biggest thing. yourself out of your comfort zone, adoptive <laughs> parent. Yes. If you yeah. don't, if you don't take anything from these two videos, the number one thing, take yourself out of your comfort zone and put yourself in the, in your child's culture. Learn about their culture. Learn about who they are, the music, the food, all of it. Learn how to make the recipes. Learn how to mm -hmm. all of it. <laughs> and even if you don't like that stuff, like my mom, I'm pretty sure my parents didn't always like my African cooking. Yeah. But I kid you not, if they didn't, they're great actors. They really like, they'll be like, mm, can I get seconds and thirds? And I'll be like, I feel so good. And I'll be like, yeah, I want to make more of this cassava leaf, you know? Like, yeah. Right. Because I mean, your child did it. And your child learned how to stomach the food that you got. Yeah. I did. And she learned, we learned how to like it. We learned yeah. how to like it. We both thought pizza tasted like mold. Like you know, nasty. Oh, like, after a while, when it was shoved down our throat, we're like, okay, it's actually kind of good. I mean, I love pizza now. Love I, it. Yeah, but in okay. the beginning, oh, yeah, my God. Good. I'm like, wh who thought this combination yeah. was a good idea? Who yeah. came up with this? <laughs> it was, yeah, it was bad. But <laughs> now, me and pizza are like best friends. Yeah. So you, you know how to like it. Just keep trying it. You know how to like the, the food. But yeah. um, that is the last topic. Do you have anything else to add? No, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening in. Again, all this stuff, uh, it's just plain tips. Mm -hmm. um, to be helpful to you, be a resource. Um, it's not to bash you, your experience as an adoptive ch um, parent or mm -hmm. child. Um, we can all do better um, with new information and knowledge. And that's all we're providing is just knowledge and education. So yeah. please don't personalize all of, you know, part one and part two of our video. Hopefully mm -hmm. you can get in and really um, utilize some of this information to better your relationship with your adoptive um, children. And for 
other people who are adopted and especially if you're transracially adopted and you have a story, we'd love to hear your story. Even if you don't have anything remark like yeah. remarkable about your story, you just want to share because it might yeah. help somebody else or be of entertainment, please please connect with us, email us. Um, you can comment down as well. And we will definitely love to have you uh, featured as a guest on our podcast. Yeah. And whether it's, it's good or bad, it's fine. We accept both kind of stories. Just come on and just tell your stories. Cause at the end of the day, again, people hearing this stuff, it helps other people. Um, but that's it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share. Thanks for tuning in again on this episode. You guys are so supportive. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you on our next episode. All right. Bye. Thanks.